What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Next, we, we move on. Protocols. I just like the word so much. I hate the word protocol. I mean, we, we are bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. Uh, so let's talk about some protocols, Jay. This is the typical protocol that men come in or have been on when they see me. So it's A plus B plus C plus D equals E. What is A? I love D. Hormone. B is time. C is estrogen management, of course. <laughs> D is sex hormone binding globulin management and or the addition of HCG. E is symptom improvement. This is not an evidence-based protocol. And we're going to go into that a little while, in just a little while. All right? What do we use? What do I use? It's this formula. It's what the medical literature uses. It's A, getting the hormone a sufficient amount to exert a response. B is time. And C is improvement in symptoms related to the hormones deficiency. So what are the mistakes that I see that happen to men that, that come in? For one, they can never get enough A. If you don't raise your testosterone levels up enough to exert a response, it's, you're not going to get a response. You're not going to get improvement in symptoms. If you don't give it enough time, once you do, you're also not going to get an improvement in your symptoms. Right. So there has to be patience on the part of the patient. I have to provide them with the testosterone. They have to take it as prescribed. And then we need to give it time to work. So whenever you see men that, uh, th that come in, I can only tell you to you, when you give a hormone in a man that is deficient or with of deficiency, it is exactly like this. It is just like giving water to a wilted plant. Right, exactly. When you put Dry water on that wilted plant, it'll pop right up yep. beautifully. And you can keep providing it water daily and you'll keep it healthy and looking good. Right. The problem that we run into is that you only go from that wilted blossom stage once. Right. Applying more water and more water like is not going to exert any significant response. So if you've got a very good response, let's say 200 milligrams of testosterone cypionate per week, and you want to say, well, I feel great. I just want to see if I feel greater. Right. It's not going to work. Going at 300, you're not going to notice an appreciable difference in your symptoms. But you will probably have better, more side effects, right? Yes. yes. You can, you, then you start getting up into a, to a side effect profile. So so, you know, once again, this is an example of more is not always better. Once you take care of those symptoms, then, you know, leave well enough alone. Right, exactly. But our mentality is more has got to be better when it comes to men. Any, uh, any additional comments on that, Jay? No, let me just ask you guys, do you guys then agree? I think we all do. But the minimum effective dosage principle should always be applied until you need to go higher. That's right. And so what is the A part? It is a guesstimation based on the man's medical status, clinical size, experience. you yeah. know, what he's been on in the past, what he's presently on. So you have to start them with a dose and then you reevaluate four to six week intervals and you adjust that dose based on levels and symptoms. All right. So Keith, I will, I do want to go deep right here. You brought something up. that's important. And again, I'm sorry if I hurt people, but why are doctors putting so many chemicals into the body at the beginning? Really? Well, because that's the way they were trained and taught. And that's because that's what, you know, a lot of these clinics will do anything the patients tell them to do. But isn't it too the about making science money forums key? and they cater to the bro science forums. And so therefore they want to maintain it's, it's quantity, not quality. Right. But isn't it out. also too, as you've told me many times that it's money, it's yeah. money. Well, that's basically what I'm, that is what I'm saying. They're, they're, it's, it's about maintaining patient volume and right. increasing patient volume, doing whatever you need to do to, get to not make them mad, to not make them mad and do, and to do what they want. In other words, to please the patient, no different than the pill mills, no different than pill right, mills. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, I remember a, a guy that owns a forum, uh, uh, does a Facebook forum recently said, well, I've got two guys that said you could be difficult. 
you know, I can't. If you come to me with any non-evidence-based medicine and request, I'm not going to do it. But let's just be honest. I mean, this is so important and so needed. You're not going to prescribe anything that they don't need. And you're literally going to say, look, if you want to go somewhere and have that happen, go somewhere else. And that's what I do. And that's what we have to do. You know, we're not going to go into too much today, like HCG, for instance. I mean, you know, even the new guidelines, some of the new guidelines that came out, uh, the European guidelines recommend not using HCG except for fertility. That's a whole well, other always podcast known. on HCG if you want. We've That's always point. known that. We've always known that. Scott's known that. Everybody who's ever used testosterone therapeutically for any length of time knows it's another androgen and estrogen spike. That's all it is. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's, it's not a bioidentical. You know, the beta unit's completely right. different. It's more right. powerful than LH, so you're more, you know, you're stimulating much more times what you would with LH right. and for a longer period of time. We don't really know what stimulating those uh, LH receptors all over the body for an extended period of time. We don't know the damage that we can actually be doing. Right. There are no long-term safety studies with HCG. No. So therefore, I shy away from it uh, just because you want to do what's best for your patient. Right. And I don't have any men that really, I, that they don't use it for, quote, testicular atrophies about 20 to 30%. Uh, most don't notice. The women really don't care. It's no. the firm erection that, that matters. So, Who wants to have hangy, sacky balls anyway? I ask that all the time. I ask some guys, you know, what is the fixation with your balls? I don't really reach down and grab I think those kind of guys the keep, don't, they don't do cardio. That's probably yeah. really what it is because if they did, they would never want like that. That might be it. But, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm fine with the way they are. I'm sure you are too. All right. So you start with A plus B equals C. So you got to start them at a dose. You have to. Uh, and so then you monitor that based on labs and symptoms. So there are three groups of men that actually come back, Jay. So first group of men come back in four to six weeks and their symptoms have significantly improved or completely resolved. That's it. They're done. They're, that's their dose. Go live life and go enjoy yourself. Second group, symptoms better, but still present. Labs improve, but not optimal. So we give that man the option of raising the dose there and then reevaluating in four to six weeks. Right. Group number three, minimal improvement but labs in an optimal range, meaning they could just be beautifully perfect. Let's just say a total testosterone of 1,600 or 350. Right. What do you think we're going to do with that guy? Because it's A plus B equals C. A is getting the hormone. B is time. C is symptomatic improvement. That guy needs time. Yeah. Okay. He's got enough. Now let's give it time to exert an effect. All right. So let's say that we give it time to exert an effect. Let's say he comes back two, three months later. He's improved, but still symptomatic. Jay, there comes a time when you have to look at some of these individuals and say, look, a lot of your symptoms are not related to testosterone species. We, we, have, we have taken care of the deficiency. Right. You know, Jay, we didn't push it to 700. We're talking about if you got a, a level of 1,800 with a free of 50, you have enough testosterone on board. Yeah. If it's yeah. not well by then, it's not testosterone. Yeah, it's lifestyle. I mean, pushing it up higher than that is not going to have any appreciable effect right. whatsoever. Right. Okay? Right. Any, to any topic on that? No, I mean, it's lifestyle. I mean, again, it is. That's yeah, when we start addressing lifestyle factors. That's when I really have the harder conversations with them again. We have it up front, but then mm -hmm. that's really when we hit it home and say, look, now we're going to have to really, you're going to have to take a critical look at yourself and your lifestyle, and we need to make changes. Right. And so I've done that recently with a guy, and uh, he was perfect, but he was still tired. And I'm like, but everything's perfect. So tell me a little bit more. He had three children under the age of five. Right. A new job, very stressful, working 14, 15 hours a day, had a wife, a new house to take care of, and he thought that testosterone would make him be able to do those things and not be tired. No. It's not going to. No. If you've got three kids under the age of five, you're going to be tired right, a exactly. lot. Yeah. All right. Next. Okay, so what are the co most common side effects we see? I just thought I'd throw that up there real quick. Yeah, no, it's good. One that we could talk about. But, you know, acne you can see, you can lower the dose or, you know. Fluid retention, that's testosterone, increases sodium absorption, just for renal tubules. You see it, you know, especially if a man goes from zero to 60, if he comes in with a testosterone level of 250 and he goes up to 1250, you can see some fluid retention. It's usually self-limited. It resolves on its own. Hair loss, of course, you, you do plenty of podcasts on that. Testicular atrophy, about 20 to 30%. Erythrocytosis, which Dr. Howell and I will be doing, uh, writing a review study on very, very soon. Uh, and then, of course, ED, and I put a question mark like uh, next to that, because in a small population of men, you know, how can they get erectile dysfunction on testosterone whenever testosterone is the treatment for erectile dysfunction? Well, of course, 
pro science going to bring it on. Always got to be estrogen. Always got to be estrogen. I mean, if you want ED, block your estrogen. But really, Jay, when we first start testosterone, a lot of these men get something they haven't had for a while or a long while. They go from zero to 60, let's say. That body needs time to acclimate. Right. That body needs to adjust. It needs to find its ratio, its homeostasis. Yeah. And some men do get ED. But you know what testosterone also does besides raising DHT and estradiol? It also raises serotonin. Right, now, exactly. we go from, and what do serotonin reuptake inhibitors do? I mean, by raising serotonin, you can certainly improve depression, but what happens to men that take uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors? Right. They can have a component of, of erectile dysfunction, you know, decreased sensitivity, anorgasmia. I went through it. And of course, Rousier said, it'll go away. I trusted him with all my heart. Yeah. It went away. Better on the other side. So if you can just get through the first couple of months, things will get better. Some men don't tolerate as high a level as others. Just lower the dose, right? Right. You know, and so and you can increase the dose slowly over time if need be. So we do see that occasional man with ED. Interestingly enough, they always appear to be in their young thirties. We we are going to get to estrogen management, right? You are have a part about that. Or are we not talking about that at all? Oh yeah, here's okay. coming right now. All right, Here we go. Keep going. But we're going to take this. Let's go through these real quick. All right. So these, this is the uh, intake form of 42-year-old male who had been to multiple previous clinics with multiple protocols involving HCG and AIs. He came in on 200 milligrams of testosterone sipionate per week. His main complaint was low libido. Uh, so he was started on, he wanted to change from injections to cream, so he's put on 100 milligrams BID of the cream. These are his pre-treatment, uh, this is his pre-treatment symptoms on 200 milligrams per week of testosterone sipionate. These were his labs from his other clinics while on testosterone sipionate. So 839, right. 111, I mean, 1111, 747, 414. All right. So I'm at his first follow-up. This is his follow-up sheet six weeks later, four to six weeks later. Go back to the original sheet. Just got to go back. So we went from that to that. All right. And here's his labs at six weeks on 100 milligrams BID of scrotal testosterone. Well, okay. Well, what do you do there? The HEA looks fine, but I don't really think anybody needs to walk around with a free testosterone 103. Right. But as you say, you've got to start people with a dose and make adjustments. So we lowered the dose. Right. He was not going to see any appreciable decline in his well-being by lowering that dose. He needed to lower the dose. Right. right? So, so we lowered the dose. So came back. This was his next follow-up. Four to six weeks after that. Oh, at that time, go back to a sheet. At that time, one more. So with a level of 2,000 of testosterone and free of 103, he was still complaining of decrease in sexual desire and libido. That was his main complaint. All right, go. So at that time, come on, he's not deficient in testosterone. Right, of course. Okay, I mean, he is not deficient. So we had the, the, the 30 minute to an hour discussion on these are some of the causes of low libido. Testosterone, low testosterone is just one of them. We've got medications, depression, stress, sleep apnea, alcohol, type 2 diabetes, obesity, not enough or too much exercise, relationship issues, low self-esteem, anxiety about performance. So we had this talk. So he came back for his repeat testing. Those are his new levels. Beautiful. Love them. Like them. And this Beautiful. is his follow-up sheet right here. Everything looks great. It's set for lack of sexual desire, libido. But look how much, look how everything's moved yep. down to none or moderate. Right. Great treatment results. All right, but here's the problem. When we had our conversation, no, uh, he began losing weight and eating healthy once he started on his testosterone with us. He started exercising, but unfortunately, his girlfriend, living girlfriend, had not done the same. She, in fact, gained over 30 pounds. He, he said, "Look, I don't really want to be rude and a and, and an a hole about it all, but you know, I mean, I feel guilty about it. But I'm just, I'm just." not attracted and said, and when I did have sex with her recently, she complained and felt like I was just going through the motions. So the point is, is that uh, this was not test going to be fixed by testosterone. This was a relationship issue. Yeah. All right. And so this is what you'll see, but this is where you can't counsel men on a forum. This took time. Yeah, of course. A lot of time. Yeah. All right. Next one. Okay, so speaking of the pharmacokinetics of testosterone and cream applied to the scrotal skin, you just saw what it can do, but you know, applying it twice a day. We know that uh, 
The testosterone administration for oral scan is well tolerated, produces a dose-dependent peak serum testosterone concentration with a much lower dose relative to the non-scrotal transdermal route. We know all that. Look, you can apply testosterone screen, cream anywhere you have skin on the body. If you got skin, you can apply it there if you want to. Okay, uh, why the scrotum? Eight times more absorption. It's thin skin, highly vascular, just an excellent place to get good absorption without having to use so much. So it's cost effective and it gets excellent levels. As you can see, yeah. Well, first off, as everybody knows, or if you don't know, if you're new to my show or whatever, I've been on it since Keith got me on for two, almost two years now. And I've never, I would never, ever even consider going back to injections. It's it me, is, me either. Me either. I was it's fine easier to travel with when you mm -hmm. travel around the world. It's easier to apply. You know, all these people come at me. I've written, obviously, articles and emails about it, about, oh, but dude, it's going to rub off. What about your wife? It's not that ish big of an issue as you and i always say like if you're having it's, it's really not right. unless they want to make it one if i was about to say it's never yeah. an issue so so the highest dose they use in this uh, on this study was 50 milligrams and it was a once a day but as you can see uh the max concentration was at 2.6 hours at 50 milligram dose that's why i recommend the the four hour three to four hours avoidance uh and the maximum Concentration was 680 nanograms per deciliter. That's about the average. I, by the way, I feel 90 minutes is enough, though. I really do. I've never had any kind yeah. of issue. I'll be honest with you. We give that four hours. I mean, it takes skin-to-skin -skin contact. We're going to go into that in a second right. to, for transference. It doesn't leap off the skin. It doesn't get in the in the laundry off the out of the you know washing machine. It does take skin-to-skin -skin contact. Skin. And there's really minimal skin-to-skin -skin contact, even on your scrotum, quite, quite frankly. <laughs> So let's look at the graph here, because I think this is interesting and uh, something to talk about. So the, the, red, the red peak is your 50 milligrams. So as you can see, it peaks around 2.6 hours, as they say. And if you look, after 12 hours, the level is still in the mid 500s or so. So there's about a 23 to 25% uh, reduction at about 12 hours after application. If you move out to 16 hours, you know, it's somewhere around 40 to 45% reduction, all right? So let's get into a J, why do you think that people apply it twice a day? Do you think it's in any study? Do you think that, uh, or why do you think that we measure it? As anybody that knows me, you've heard on the show plenty of times, I apply it twice a day. Uh, I measure it five hours after application. But does anybody have any idea why that even is? It's not, I, I can go ahead and tell you the answer. It's not written anywhere. It's not you in figure it out on your own. Yeah, it's clinical at practice. It is absolutely clinical acumen. Clinical acumen, it's what we have found, what Dr. Rousier, what I have found, makes our patients feel the best, function the best. Is it okay to do it once a day? Absolutely. Nothing to say you can't do it. Can you do it every other day? Absolutely. Can you rub it anywhere else on your body, behind your knees, top of your foot, shoulder, <laughs> inner thigh? Oh, yes, you can. Why do I do it to scrotum twice a day? Because I get the best results using that way. It's pure clinical Acumen. Acumen. Pete, what if you put it right here on the tip of your nose? Dude? That's right. So why five hours though? I mean, look, we could measure any hour afterwards. If we want a higher number, we can measure earlier. If we want a lower number. We want a 45, 40 to 45% lower number. Hell, I can measure it 16 hours. Or if I want a 25% reduction, I measure it 12. Right. What is it about the five? Well, you know, when you measured all these different time frames, what you did find ultimately at five hours was that you got a number that, but please both the patient and me, and that we can make a good adjustment. You know, the numbers seem to correlate very well with symptomatic improvement. You know, literally you'll have guys come in and if I were to measure them 16 hours later, let's say, and they drop by 20, by 40%, and you show them their numbers, no matter if they feel great, they go, oh man, I thought it was gonna be higher than that. I, I don't feel so good, I need to raise my dose. But- And, and hold you know, on, and you know, so many men are brainwashed. They're just numbers. like that, man. Listen, I'll, before they, some of them have not seen their labs. They haven't had a chance. They're too busy and they will feel great. And, uh, and you'll call them back and well, what's my levels, doc? Well, your level's 1200 with a free of three. Oh man. Dude. And again, where do they get this nonsense from? Exactly. The low science boards and social media BS that they it read is. about accepted ranges. Right. Well, even though they'll say they want somebody to treat symptoms and not numbers, if that number's not as high as they wanted to, they don't feel as good, do they? So that's the problem. It's a damned if you do, damned if you don't with us physicians. All right. So the bottom line is that twice a day application is what we use. The five hours after application is what we use. It's what Rousier, myself, and other providers 
have found works right. best for our patient population. Do you have to do it that way? No, you can do it any way you want to do it. There's right. nothing, there's no roadmap, as I tell my patients, there's no right. cookbook that we can follow. This is what this is what we do that works best for our patients. So that's the explanation of twice a day and five hours. Okay. Yeah. So with the scrotal administration, uh, it provides high bioavailability, dose-dependent peak serum testosterone concentration, and tolerability with a much lower dose relative to the non-scrotal uh, transdermal route. So use less, get great results, patient saves money, everybody happy. All right. And by, by the way, let me ask you, because these are the questions I get all the time about that. Like, do you prefer, um, you know, I, I, uh, the, the place in Utah, what, what is it? Um, Okay, here's what I prefer. Here's all that I require. I can't here's all we require. Tier one is that you've got to independently test your product. And that costs those uh, companies about $3,000 to do that. Right. And some companies refuse to independently test their product. If, you're, if the company won't guarantee potency, then I, can't, I have to take that out of right. the equation when it comes to people not improving or numbers not coming up. I never have to worry about that with the ones I use because I know we're getting a potent product that is exactly as it says it is. So that's the key right there. So, so let me ask you a question though, important question. And, 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 I'm, and obviously I'm all about testing. And by the way, what is the name of the place in Utah? My brain's melted right now. MedQuest. MedQuest. I wanted to keep saying LabQuest. I'm like, what the hell? So, um, cause there'll be people that will come at you or come at me and they'll be like, Jay, Versa based cream or HRT based cream at 200 milligrams per milliliter is all the same. How are you going to prove to me that it's not? So anyway, that's what they say. Hey man, I see it all the time when, when we test labs. See, that's where you have to actually be in a clinic right. and see people that are on different products. Okay, I got you. See, I don't run into that anymore, but we did. And when I see people come in from outside clinics, it can be a hit or miss. So, okay, so that's a good answer. So you're, you're definitely concerned about the quality and, and, and you're not saying bad things about any specific manufacturer, but you're no. saying test it. If you will independently test your product, I'll use your product. Right. Okay. There are some big national chains that will say, I'm not going to independently test our product. Right. So if you're not going to do that, then I can't guarantee to my patients or myself that the potency is what it says it is. Got That's it. the whole reason to independently test it. Got it. Good, right? good answer. Okay. All right. So let's talk about a transference case and we're talking about transference. Hey, sometimes truth can be stranger than fiction. Right. Right. So 32 year old male treated with transdermal trans testosterone. As with a lot of males, and we need to talk about this, he became obsessed with his body composition. The weekly, the two times, three times weekly selfies in the gym mirror with his shirt off. Became obsessed with testosterone related forums. So just became obsessed with the whole idea of testosterone and how good he looked with his shirt off and staying on the internet. The wife began having acne and had levels uh, tested showing some elevated testosterone. Patient states he followed all precautions and that, quote, we haven't had sex in at least six weeks, maybe more, in quotation. What do you think would be going on here, Jay? Uh, I mean, I come up with a lot of different answers. <laughs> all right. All right. Go to the next one. Well, here we go. When wife confronted, she admitted to applying <laughs> the testosterone to herself. Jesus Husband's Christ. obsession with self and all things testosterone and caused problems in the marriage. Here's the issue. When men get on testosterone, it goes from, oh, I'm doing it for my health and do it for preventive medicine. And it always becomes about body composition. I've had physicians come forward to me about, you know, checking Facebook accounts and all this and looking at all the men. And they say, well, Keith, if it's really about health, then why are all these men posting selfies with their shirts off? So you don't see me do that anymore. And it becomes an obsession for them. And it really gives a bad taste in ma mainstream medicine's mouth and makes it us less credible. Yeah. Because it appears that, oh, yeah, they really need testosterone, right? Look at them. They're, you know, 5% right. body fat, 210 pounds. So the point is, is that it can cause problems. I would stress to any man, right. pay attention to the wife at home. Don't become obsessed with testosterone. Don't become obsessed with your self-image to where, you know, I'll, I, you know, when I've started defriending anybody that posts selfies, two to three selfies a week with their shirts off in the bathroom, I, I find that it's, it's too Kardashian for me anymore. It really is. Do you actually have patients doing that? No, I don't. But there are patients on Facebook in general. And, you know, some of them are clinic owners. Some of them are clinic owners, you know. Wow. And so, uh, I, you know, it's a really a cry for attention, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, but it really, uh, 
I don't know if it really helps everybody's argument that to give us. No, I'm totally with you, man. They're blowing it down. They're blowing it down. Are they not, Jay? I mean, does that help their cause about getting their family doctor to give them testosterone whenever they do? The next thing they see, if they look at their social media account, they're just there with their shirt off. No, let me just make a, a, a social message about that because you guys are doing an amazing job of proving this, that we live in the most toxic environment of all time. And people definitely need to have their hormones optimized and they need to work with people that can help them. And when you bro it down, you just cause more you know, demonization and propaganda from the idiots of saying, you see, this is what testosterone does. Yeah. It's- well, I had a physician, you know, confront me and one of my ex-partners about this just very thing about, you know, I mean, if it's all about health, then, then why right. is this all that I see? And I, and I couldn't argue the point. I could not argue the point. You're right, man. All right, next. Case number two, 42 year old male on transdermal testosterone, six months, overweight, workaholic, alcohol use, mild to moderate ED before he started. Wife began to develop his male facial hair growth, acne, had testosterone levels tested, levels elevated. Patient states that all precautions were taken and that sex or lack of had been an ongoing problem for them in their marriage. What's going on here? Same thing. PCOS? No. Well, Testosterone won't fix a lot of things. Go ahead. Next one. Oh, there we go. Wife confronted. She admitted yeah, a long term affair. She's banging somebody Her else. Her partner was on transdermal testosterone applied to the chest and shoulders. <laughs> it will not fix a bad marriage, Jay. It may make mm-hmm. it worse. Of course. So uh, you, you've got to really pay attention to home, your lifestyle, what's going on around you. Hormones will not repair or fix problems unrelated to them. Remember so, what we said, keep to be a, a panacea, as we've all said. Remember what we said a long time ago, only you can fix you. <laughs> That's right. All right, here you go, Jay. This is all you now. This is it's where you want to go. This is where you want to go. This is your present. We're all right, so, from- so we got to, you guys, this is so deep. I'm going to have to break this up into two, but all right, uh, we got we to gotta wrap this up in about 15 minutes. All right. Unless you guys want to just stop it and we'll just do another one. How much longer do you think you got? This is on testosterone. So I've got several slides and you may want to talk. I mean, this is on estrogen. So you may want to take 20, 30 minutes on this one. Um, all right. Just keep going. All right. So where did the, uh, so let's go to the straight to the fact of where did the uh, controlling estrogen in the mid range come from? It came from this study. Let's just get it out there. So people have it. So it came from looking at circulating estradiol and mortality in men with systolic uh, chronic heart failure. So they looked at about 501 men and they measured their estrogen levels and they divided them into five quintiles. So five quintiles. The third quintile was right in the middle. Make a long story short, among men with chronic heart failure and reduced left ventricular uh, uh, fraction, uh, high and low concentrations of estradiol compared with the middle quintile of estradiol are related to an increased mortality. So men with high and low estradiol had increased mortality. These men were not on testosterone, right. they in fact had heart failure. So they noted in this, in this study themselves that there are two major findings arising from the study. First, we have shown that in men with stable chronic heart failure and reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, there's a U-shaped outcome in relationship to serum estradiol concentrations. Both high and low concentrations of circulating estradiol are significant predictors of a poor prognosis. So meaning that if you had high estradiol, you had a poor prognosis, a low estradiol, you had a poor prognosis. Second, we have observed that men with either decreased or increased concentrations of serum estradiol have different clinical characteristics, suggested that the underlying pathophysiological mechanisms are not the same. In the study, the men with loss of renal function, kidney failure, which may have contributed to the low estradiol and mortality. On the other hand, the I estradiol group is, uh, demonstrated a de- deterioration of liver function, liver failure. So you got kidney failure, you're going to have low estradiol, liver failure, you've got high estradiol. So you got men with congestive heart failure, with liver failure, kidney failure. They're not very well, Jay. Right. All right. So men with chronic heart failure and decreased serum estradiol levels were characterized by reduced total fat tissue mass. So we may hypothesize that low circulating estradiol is due to decreased activity of adipose aromatase. These men were cachectic, okay? They were sick men. So the observational character of the studies acknowledged the study was not designed to elucidate the underlying the detrimental mechanisms of low and high concentrations of serum estradiol in men with chronic heart failure and reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. 
No simple explanation is evident to explain the findings. We propose the deranged liver metabolism, the secondary hepatocyte failure may be a possible mechanism underlying increased serum estradiol levels, where decreased serum estradiol levels may be due to decreased amount of function of adipose tissue. All right, Jay, there you go. So these are men not on testosterone. And so men, so people took an observational study and extrapolated the results to men on testosterone and that you should keep your estradiol in the mid range because men with high testosterone, I mean, high estradiol, or low estradiol had increased mortality. That's right. where it came from. Right. And by the way, those men were liver failure and renal failure. I mean, and highly, high, and, and, and the highly uh, yeah, and with congestive heart failure. So yeah, they're very sick men, but their, their, their estradiol levels were due to two different things, liver failure. Insanity, man. Nothing to do with testosterone, nothing at all. So nothing control all. it, just control it. But let me tell you an interesting thing. We could have posted more studies. What happens when you give man with congestive heart failure testosterone? Make them better. They improve. Wow, amazing. How does that happen? <laughs> all right, here we amazing. go with studies. Effects of testosterone treatment on body fat and lean mass in obese men on a hypochloric diet, diet, a randomized control trial. So bottom line, what this study was about is that they gave, you know, obese men, they put them on a diet and they gave them testosterone compared on the people that were not on testosterone. So the dieting men receiving placebo, receiving placebo lost both fat and lean mass. The weight loss with testosterone treatment was almost exclusively due to loss of body fat. So when we diet, we lose both lean body mass and fat mass. But when we take testosterone, it prevents the loss of lean body mass and we lose just fat mass. Don't we know, Keith? Yeah. So this is very important. <laughs> so the combined lean body mass and fat mass reduction in the placebo group were similar in magnitude to the fat mass reduction in the testosterone group, which explained why there was no difference in body mass change between the two groups at the end of the study. If you look above at the chart there, there was only the weight loss was minus 10 in the testosterone group minus nine. But look what happened is the uh, testosterone group lost predominantly all visceral fat with hardly any loss whatsoever of lean body mass, yep. whereas the dieting group without testosterone lost lean body mass in addition to fat mass. So what this study is trying to point out is that weight loss versus body composition improvement. So whenever you do uh, caloric restriction to target weight loss, what happens is you're going to lose fat mass and lean body mass. And whenever you uh, take testosterone, you know, you're going to preserve that. And men on testosterone, you may not lose the weight when it comes to stepping on a scale, but you have a change of body composition. So if they have a myopic focus on weight loss alone, you know, it can mask important body composition changes. So you hear, how many times do you hear that? I've been on testosterone, I've not lost any weight, but right. yet their pants are looser. Their right. shirt. Well, I mean, high. again, this is a lifestyle conversation. This is when you, again, you have to work with an intelligent doctor who understands the differences because a lot of doctors don't guys, let's face it. They don't understand the differences. Well, they don't. And so, you know, I, I, that's why I don't really like scales. I'd, I'd rather people look at oh, no, scales talking. are useless. They are totally useless. And that's what this study is basically pointing out is don't look for weight loss to be just look at the body composition. How do your clothes fit? fit? How do your right. clothes fit? How you clothes fit? How you look in the mirror? All right. And I'll make these quick. I'm trying to talk fast because now you got to no, go. No, 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 right. go. You're good. You're good. You're good. So here we go. The effects of testosterone uh, on body composition in obese men are not sustained after cessation of testosterone treatment. This piggybacks onto the last study. So these men lost all this weight, body fat, visceral fat, had all these improvements in body composition. But once they stopped testosterone, they were not sustained. Those results went away. So if you see all the time, well, should I stop testosterone? Well, only if you want to lose the results because you will. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. You will not maintain the results if you get off. Right. Okay. These will be quick. Effects of testosterone therapy on metabolic parameters for up to 10 years and 115 hypogonadal elderly men. So these were once again, obese men. All right. And they were placed on testosterone for up to 10 years. In these obese men that were treated with testosterone, they, uh, they had a decline in hemoglobin A1C. They had a decrease in the ratio of triglycerides to high density lipoprotein. They had an increase in HDLs, all right? They decreased their total cholesterol. Uh, there was decreased observed, uh, decrease in the systolic and diastolic blood pressures. There was a decrease in C-reactive protein and there were no major adverse cardiovascular events. Just keep that in mind. So we had all these, changes in parameters of health 
in obese men taking testosterone. Okay? Another study, effects of long-term treatment with testosterone on weight and waist size in 4 and 11 hypogonadal men with obesity classes 1 to 3. Obesity class 3 is a BMI greater than 40, by the way. Right. So we're More giving these obese. truly big obese More men obese. Yes. testosterone, all right, for up to five years, all right? And when we did that, it had an effect on to achieve sustained weight loss in obese men, and it didn't matter about the severity of their obesity. Next slide. What happened is they uh, showed that in men with various classes of obesity and testosterone, long-term T produced significant and sustained weight loss, marked reductions in waist circumference and BMI. It had uh, reduced, they had reduced blood glucose, hemoglobin A1C, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, C-reactive protein, improved lipid profiles. Uh, they also had marketing significant improvements in various metabolic parameters clear, that clearly indicate improvements in metabolic function as it reflected by a decrease in inflammatory biomarkers and improved liver function. So once again, given morbidly obese men, testosterone, and we noted these changes, okay? Hypogonadal obese men with and without diabetes mellitus type two lose weight and show improvements in cardiovascular risk factors when treated with testosterone, an observational study. All received testosterone, you know, the waist cir 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 circumference decreased, their BMI decreased. Next one. Uh, the, uh, the serum glucose, hemoglobin A1C, lipid profiles, and blood pressure improved significantly. Uh, testosterone treatment as assessed by hemoglobin, hematocrit, serum prostate specific antigen, and occurrence of prostate cancer was acceptably safe. So, once again, another study given obese men testosterone. Long-term testosterone treatment in elderly men with hypogonadism and erectile dysfunction reduces obesity parameters and improves metabolic syndrome and health-related quality of life. So given testosterone improved body weight, waist circumference, BMI, lower total cholesterol, LDL, triglycerides, fasting blood glucose, hemoglobin A1C, and blood pressure over the five-year study, HDL cholesterol was increased. All right. They had improvement in long-term health-related quality of life. I don't know what else more, what we can ask for. Testosterone replacement therapy improves insulin resistance, glycemic control, visceral adiposity, and hypercholesterolemia and hypogonadal men with type 2 diabetes. So given these men test, even these obese men testosterone, it reduced insulin resistance, improved glycemic control. Uh, it included improved insulin resistance, cholesterol, visceral adiposity. It, it just overall reduced cardiovascular risk. Remission of type 2 diabetes, treatment of a man with testosterone, 57-year-old man with erectile dysfunction, type 2 diabetes, he was overweight, hypertension, dyslipidemia, treated with testosterone, resolved his type 2 diabetes. All right, Jay, question. Oh, okay. Okay. What do all these studies have in common? Testosterone should be frontline treatment for pretty much every ailment. It's insulin <laughs> sure. related or uh, insulin resistance related. Well, sure. So, but but one thing they have in in common is that we treated obese men, right? Very obese men with testosterone, right? That's they all have that in common, right? Anything else? I, I mean, it works. It resolves their symptoms. Well, but that's right. It worked. Can you see any of these studies where it didn't work? No. Nope. And it worked in all of them. Okay. So the point is, is that sometimes we need to look at what they didn't do. Maybe we're taking a little different approach today than we've taken in the past. So what did they not do in these studies? Specifically? Uh, yeah. They gave them testosterone. You got oh, ones. they obviously are not measuring. They don't give a shit about their estrogen. Wow. Jay, you're stud, man. There you go. <laughs> so what they have in common is obese men treated with testosterone. No control of estrogen with an AI. No manipulation of SHBG and no HCG. Jay, when I first met you... <laughs> Years ago, they were under the impression that if a really fat man started testosterone, he might right. need to take an AI for a short period of time because he's going to over aromatize. Right, right. Evidence based medicine shows that you give testosterone into every single one of those men. When you raise their testosterone level, you're raising their estrogen levels. Absolutely. And by the way, just so you guys know, and you don't know this, but today's article is on why you should never suppress estrogen. And you haven't seen it. And I know it, it published at like 11 a.m. or whatever, but it's all Neil's research. And I publicly admitted that the book, which you, you know, told me then, and obviously Neil's research was new. I mean, the book was written in 2018, but 
there is no estrogen dominance. It's insulin resistance. It's insulin resistance. That's right. So which is from inflammation. That's right. So they did not manipulate SHBG. They didn't use HCGJ. They just simply used testosterone and let it do what it does. And guess what? These men weren't complaining of estrogen symptoms. But Keith, I'm a high SBH, SHBG guy. What do I do? Isn't it amazing how they didn't have to calculate their SHBG so that they can know exactly how to microdose and how often to inject and how to, <laughs> you know, it's amazing these, these formulas that we come up with when it's really as simple as replacing a deficiency with a sufficient amount to exert a response. But uh, the, the new argument is that, well, we don't talk about suppressing estrogen. We talk about just lowering or controlling it. I don't see anybody Negative. controlling it. So Negative. I can only tell you this. I cannot provide you with any study since testosterone was discovered in the mid-1930s right. that showed benefits in a man right. where they controlled, manipulated, did whatever to estrogen or SHBG. Right. Okay. You know, I don't need to know an SHBG to optimize a man. If he, it's his free testosterone that we're following. You know, if you have to use a higher dose because his free testosterone is is difficult to raise. Well, of course he's gonna have high HCPG. And, Keith, and, and by the way, and, and I've said this to so many people since you and I first started talking about three years ago, but the, real, the reality is, is that um, there is no concern of that when you optimize a man's testosterone levels. It will no. resolve itself. Jay, it's really simple, but it's so simple that I guess right. the caveman could do it or else we would be able to do it. Uh, yeah. but, but, you know, uh, you know, Henry Ford said there's nothing so simple that it can't be made more complicated. Right, and exactly. that's what these right. guys fall for is they fall for these fancy sales tactics or these complicated formulas. And it, you know, they just become obsessed with this whole idea and it, and it really is much simpler. And I'll tell you what I try to convince our patient or what I hope that they do is that once you get them in an optimal range, they all come in and they're like relieved and they're like, man, I'm so glad to not be worrying about all that anymore, that estrogen, that SHBG and the, ACG and I can just go live my life and I, that's what I, I mean my goal is to get you to live your life and spend time with your family I mean if I didn't have to do what I did for a living I would not be on the internet I would not be doing this I'd be out playing and and doing everything else exactly exactly being in nature exactly well I know you got to go I made you a few slides just no, no 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 keep going away. dude we're good but, no no uh, we're good so, so is there anything you wanted to hit on this any questions anything you want to no, I mean I think it's profound I mean I, I think we should a couple of things just to, you know, just to recap. I mean, do you have more slides? I just, just I just was going to touch, you know, we could talk. Yeah, no, um, hit them, I mean, hit them. You, you mentioned just one power away. Just remember. Well, I definitely want to talk about estrogenic side effects or high estrogen side effects because we both know, and again, I wrote about that in today's article, there's no such thing. You're either inflamed with insulin resistance or you're right. not. Well, Scott's head's will blow off you mentioned estrogen symptoms because he okay, said exactly but, well, what that's you right, say all the so, time. There's no such thing as estrogen symptoms. Exactly. There's no such thing. And, and let's put that out there right now. And, you know, I wish this would have probably been in the middle of the podcast, but I'm going to end up breaking this up and then let you guys decide how we want to do it because there's so I much. I figured you would. It's okay. Do it how you want to well, do it. Well, no, there's so much reason. profound content in this. But, okay, so let's talk about this. So I wrote in today's blog that there's just inflammation and insulin resistance. And – Obviously, people respond differently, as you guys have proven, and due, due, due to androgen receptor sensitivity and insensitivity. But the reality is, is that people that have elevated um, estradiol, which, as you guys know, is, shouldn't even be looked at because, again, it's about symptom resolution. But if they are looking at it and they've been so, quote, unquote, quacked by seven other doctors, and so their mind is focused on the number, and they see an, el an, an elevation in their sensitive estradiol, you know, again, from being optimized, the bottom line is, and again, I want your guys' clarification on this, is it's normally just due to their insulin resistance, their level of inflammation, and probably they have high amounts of visceral fat, correct? Correct. At baseline. Yes, we have plenty of studies that show baseline observation with high estradiol is associated exactly. with increased mortality. That's a baseline observation, and yes, that's insulin resistance and fat. So when people, and both you guys can answer this, so when people freak out, and you guys know this, right? And again, they've been so brainwashed by the internet. You know, I see, I still see nonsense. I, I, I attempt to not respond to it anymore, but they'll be like, my, my estrogen shot up to 58. <laughs> well, Jay, imagine the reason I uh, approach it this way today, instead of the, the typical way we've all been approaching is just kind of go after AIs is that. I just showed you study after study after right, study right. of morbidly obese men. Right. Now, would you imagine their heads would blow off if you measure their estradiol? What it was at baseline, what it might have been when you started testosterone, but yet right. what happened? 
in these men and these studies, all of their parameters of health improved. That yeah. leads us to one thing that I definitely needed to top up, top up on, super physiologic levels. And those levels are Rousier and Nichols get out. Right. And you're my classic example. I asked you to talk about your lab work, which you posted a, 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 a paper on. I have seen this written where Dr. Rousier and Dr. Nichols, I mean, hey, I'm always proud to be mentioned in the same sentence as Dr. Rousier, believe me. Uh, but they don't know what the harm they may be doing long term to these men by putting their levels at that range. I don't know what that range they're talking about. I mean, yes, we're, we're one to 2,000 potentially, but, uh, but uh, whatever the man needs and the least amount that he needs to exert a response and improve their symptoms. But here's what we can do from a clinical standpoint. The people that make those type of comments are not clinicians and not been doing this for decades. When you have been, you see what number it takes to decrease body fat, to maintain lean muscle mass, and improve parameters of health. Right. So I can't tell you the number of men that come in that started feeling a little bit better when their levels got up to the upper range of normal, but just were starting to feel better, and then they'd back off their dose, wouldn't give them anymore. And all you had to do is give them enough to exert a response. The point that I'm really getting at is that whenever we're able to measure parameters of health, which we are, which all these studies just did, and every single one of those parameters improve at those, quote, levels, what long-term damage is being done, Jay? Exactly. I mean, uh, every parameter of health. Now, if we started seeing a detriment in those parameters of health, then let's have a conversation. But the point is, is that at those, quote, levels, nothing but improvement, and you're actually living proof of that. For the first time, your HDLs were above, uh, were in a normal range, correct? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that will be my answer to that, is that we see it clinically, over a period of decades, we're tr all treating men and all these parameters of health improve at quote, those levels, in quotation. So, you know, if you don't want to have all those parameters of health improve, then raise your testosterone a little bit into the mid range of normal. Right, yeah. Um, I mean, guys, this has been so phenomenal. I mean, I, I really don't really have, I think we pretty much covered everything. Like I told you guys, I wanted to make this kind of like a TOT Bible volume two. I think we covered, you know, the mistakes, clearly the mistakes in the book, not talking about women because there was definitely a lot of um, bad information on women, but uh, but I think you know the understanding that there are no high estrogen side effects. It, they, they don't exist. There, it's bro science. I mean, Scott could talk about it, but it is. It's absolutely, totally bro science. It comes from the bodybuilding world, and yes, mm -hmm. it's important to state that super physiologic levels of a lot of things, polypharmacy, will increase water retention. It will increase mood instability. It will do these other things. Right. But again, using an AI to suppress those symptoms is still terrible for your health. And obviously on my Ben Pokolsky podcast, and I'm glad that Ben has made a stand and going out there and telling professional bodybuilders that, hey, just because you think that the AI is suppressing the side effects, it's still causing massive risk to your health. Well, it's even more risk in uh, bodybuilders of using androgens than right. someone on T TRT. If you look at the case reports of illicit, uh, that myocardial infarction, the forensic reports, and you put those slides, histology slides, next to the ERCO studies, the estrogen receptor knockout, right. the pathology is identical. Collagen infiltration, it's diffuse throughout from the apex all the way up, up through the Purkinje fibers to the heart. Well, Jay, I will tell you, there'll be guys that are arguing right now and say, well, I know that I need it because I just get ED and all these problems whenever I, it gets out of whack. Here's the problem. Those guys have never allowed their body to, really optimize. Find, to acclimate. They never found their what ratio? The androgen to the estrogen ratio. You have right. to, your body will find its own ratio, Absolutely. but it can take a couple of months to acclimate and find your homeostasis. And then you're all on the other side and better for it. But it, there, you can have some side effects. From the testosterone. Well, I mean, all, all androgens cause nitrogen retention and uh, right. uptake of minerals. Right. So what yeah. happens with that? You have about a four to six week period where aldosterone starts to bounce up and down. Right. Is that estrogen or yep. is it the testosterone? It goes away. That's right. the point. I think the point that Rousier has always made is that if they just give it time to go away, it goes away. Yeah. Scott, I'm going to bring you back on, just you and me, and we're going to help steroid using bodybuilders and we're going to go really really deep and we're going to talk about the truth and get rid of all the bro science and the misconceptions and talk about this because you're right i mean there's a lot of misinformation out there and you know guys really do need 
in my opinion, and I know in both of your guys' opinion, who are using, you know, polypharmacy and mega super physiologic dosages, they really do need to understand the harm that they're doing to themselves by using high dose AIs. I mean, I've heard stories of guys using two milligrams a day of a Remedex. Yeah. And you wonder why they feel bad. I mean, that's terrible. I mean, let me ask you this and then, and then you guys can say how people can work with you. Uh, yes or no, that a lot of probably the, the young bodybuilders who have died was most likely due to some sort of systemic issue from high dosages of androgen blocking medications. I believe that 100%. Because I've looked at Rich Piano, I've looked at Dallas Carver, I've looked too. at all the forensic I reports. Too. The one missing component out of all those case reports is aromatase inhibitor use. Androgens by themselves in high doses aren't that harmful. Exactly. And by the way, Ben Pekulski has gone on record saying that. It's true. It's absolutely true. Guys, amazing. Love you guys. How can people work with you when they watch this podcast? Well, we've got two components here. Dr. Howell will talk about the, health, the, the, you know, the Center for Research, but we're at Tier 1 Health and Wellness. It's tier1hw.com. Uh, you, know, uh, you can contact us on Monday through Friday. We're here uh, five days a week. And uh, remember, iron sharpens iron, brother. Does. Yeah, man. I mean, seriously, guys, I love you guys so much. This is so amazing. We'll talk. I just have to run. I'm I'm a daddy daycare right now, so I got to run and get my daughter. Right. But uh, amazingly right. profound. I will talk to you guys very soon. But Scott, I am going to bring you back on very very soon. Um, I appreciate you guys. I mean, so much. Remember, everybody in the audience, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation.